Hi, I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Time to talk about the movies that may be a little rotten, but we love them anyway. <laughs> Joel Mears is here with us. How are you? I'm awesome. How are you doing? Good to meet you. Congratulations meet you. on the book. Yeah, we're really excited about it. This must have been a blast to put together. It was. You know, we sort of, I think people would think Rotten Tomatoes going to release its first book, first book in 20 around, 21 crazy. years yeah. we've been around. We haven't released a book. And I think there's maybe an assumption, why don't you do something about the freshest movies ever mm. or the best movies of all time? Like, no way. <laughs> we want to get <laughs> dirty and rotten. Yes. Um, because I think there's a perception that, you know, we're not we're not interested in rotten movies or we just dismiss them but actually rotten movies are some of the movies that have borrowed their ways deeply into our hearts like totally. this film this <laughs> which is, is on the cover yeah, yeah Step Brothers you know 55% on the tomato meter not particularly well received when it was first released uh, 2008 I believe mm -hmm. um, but has become the most quotable sort yeah. of fun Will Ferrell John C. Riley joint that there is and I think um, there's something about the journeys that films go on after they release and after they've had their critical reception that is pretty Pretty interesting. Definitely. And this got mm -hmm. a nice second balance once it got into cable, DVD. Yep. But even still, like at the time, this was a funny movie. Why do you think <laughs> it wasn't received in such a great way? Uh, well, you know, again, 55% is not. Ten, not bad, because like the aver percent. average is like what, like in the 60s? The average is in the low 60s, okay. yeah. When yeah, you yeah. do, when we push the button and say, right. what's the average <laughs> score for all movies ever? It's about 64. And you, okay, so this is still a, this is a good It's still not bad. It's just yeah. below average. You know, if you were doing a report card, like try harder next year, and maybe you'll, <laughs> you'll get up there. But you, comedy is very subjective, mm -hmm. I think, which is one of the, the issues that certain comedies, particularly broad comedies, yeah. face when they're, when they're put before critics. Um, so I think maybe that's why it didn't connect. It is juvenile, like wonderfully so. Definitely. <laughs> um, it's a beautifully juvenile film. It's kind of silly, and sometimes that doesn't connect with certain people. Mm. I think also, does it, you know, what if you're a critic and you go and you're like, I'm not a huge Will Ferrell fan or something. Mm. So there are all those factors which can work against a film, but obviously it didn't do too badly because right. we're still talking yeah, about we'll Step to this day. And it was also like Will Ferrell had been on such a great stretch of movies yes. too. It can be, and we've seen this with Adam Sandler. It's like, yeah, he's done great work, but we're kind of a little bit tired of it. And you have Sandler in there as well. We have Sandler. We've got uh, Billy Madison, which yeah. I love Billy Madison. And what did you guys give it? Uh, well, it's not us. <laughs> so whenever people say, what did Rotten Tomatoes right. give it or what did you give it? And I'm like, well, so just to clarify Rotten yeah, Tomatoes, let's, let's yeah, go let's, go, let's get yeah, into yeah. it. But So Rotten Tomatoes is a review aggregator. Mm -hmm. So we essentially curate or aggregate all of the reviews by the critics we approve to be part of our pool. Um, Which is how many that have been people? Written. Well, there's thousands. Mm. There's thousands. Um, but, you know, they're not all writing reviews of a movie. Right. So when a movie like Step Brothers comes out, if you're a Tomato Meter approved critic, we take your review, we give it a fresh or a positive to sort of say whether you gave it a thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, we put it into the system and the percentage that gave it a thumbs up or fresh in our language is what the, the score is. So right. for a movie that gets 100 reviews and 65 of those are fresh, that's a 65%. So that's how it works. Okay. We do the curation. I do a lot of original content separately, but we're not the actual critics. So gotcha. when you say, what did we give Billy Madison? It's really, what did it's, the people give what did the, what did the critics give right. Billy Madison? And I, oh, goodness, it's not on the top of my head, but I think it's like, in the 30s or 40s. Okay. It's not like a super low film. Not awful, but a little no. bit No, and he was just starting then. You right. know, he was just starting that what became known as really an Adam Sandler movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, that was sort of setting the template with that and then uh, Happy Gilmore um, and then I guess Big Daddy. But yeah, Sandler's in there. Incidentally, Sandler is having a year. It really is. Uncut Gems, a yeah. uh, new movie coming out in December. It is, I think it might still be 100% fresh right now. Wow. Yeah, it might be oh, yeah, very, very high 90s at least. Uh, it's phenomenal and I think one of the men from this book could be up for an Oscar this year. Wow, mm. that's really high praise. Yeah, he's really good. Because I saw the Meyerowitz stories with him, yeah. and I really enjoyed that. And it was a totally different side of Sandler that I hadn't seen before. Yeah, he does He does occasionally drop these bombs, right. doesn't he? He's <laughs> like, I'm going to do the murder one on Netflix, yeah. and I'm going to do what uh, Grown Up 17, yep. <laughs> but then I'm going to like go and hook up with Noah Baumbach, yeah. and, or I'm going to go with the Safdie brothers, or I'm going to go with P.T. Anderson. And he does these performances that you're like, oh, actually, you're pretty awesome. Like a legit His actor. Netflix special, um, interestingly, was called 100% Fresh mm. as a kind of ironic take yeah, on yeah. his usual tomato meter right. score. <laughs> but that, that Netflix special, we, we rate those as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it's certified fresh. It's a That's great awesome. special. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, just the whole thing with Sandler, like that he was in on Netflix before all this stuff really got going. He's smart. He's really smart. He's smart. He yeah. knows what he's doing. And he's delivering what people love. Yeah, and I think and that, what kids love too yeah. with all those grown ups movies. You know? And that's kind of the vibe of the book. It's right. kind of like just because something isn't necessarily critically appreciated, it doesn't mean you can't love it or there aren't reasons to love it. Or in some cases, that the film didn't go on an interesting journey mm -hmm. after its release. Totally. So we saw, you know, Step Brothers came out, did moderately well at the box office, got a decent tomato meter score, but wasn't considered fresh, but its journey in the last 11 years has to become this sort of cult classic. And a lot of the films in this book are more sort of well-known cult classics, but it's interesting to go back and realize that they weren't well received at the time, like Empire Records mm. or Wet Hot American Summer. These are films that didn't make much money at the box office at all, um, were kind of dismissed and forgotten, but found a second life. Right. Because as you alluded to earlier, it's that uh, distribution model. So people discover them at their local box office. Uh, Blockbuster, sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Even like Office Space in 99, you know? Office I had the, Space. Like that was, nobody went to go see that nobody thing. Nobody went to go see yeah. it. I think that's pretty fresh though. I think the, criti yeah, I think I think the critics now, embraced, yeah. now embraced Office Space. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a sort of strange life. Like Paul Feig does mm -hmm. the, um, he's the director of Bridesmaids. Bridesmaids right. He does the foreword to this book and he sort of talks about how as a filmmaker you never set out to make a bad movie, yada, yada, yada. But the, one of the things I sort of really touched on in that was that you put a movie out into the world, you end it, you can't change anything, it's edited, unless right. you're one of those people like Ridley Scott who just keeps doing director's <laughs> cuts, <laughs> director's can't, can't cuts. Doing that. But yeah, so you put it out there and then it's really up to the world what happens. So mm -hmm. there's a first stage which is a critical reception, get your tomato meter right. score. Then what happens is sometimes a community finds it and sometimes a community latches on. Um, and it can become a classic or at least something beloved to a certain group. Totally. So mm -hmm. how many of these movies did you go back and watch? Like which ones kind of piqued your interest a little bit more in 2019 than when oh, you saw them? So it's you know, I wrote, um, the structure of the book is that the staff, our staff wrote mm -hmm. um, the majority of it. It's 101 movie recommendations. 16 of those were extended essays by uh, sort of prominent critics right. though, as well. So you've got your Leonard Moltons and that kind of thing writing about rotten movies they love. So as a staff member, I got to write um, a, a, a really good amount of these actually. That's cool. And there were some that I really enjoyed rewatching, which were, um, I mean, all of them I enjoyed rewatching sure. to a certain extent. but. I love Tokyo Drift, mm. Fast and the Furious, yeah, yeah. Tokyo Drift, <laughs> which is, I think, the bastard stepchild of that series, but is like yeah. amazing. Um, There's been so many, but then when you just pinpoint one of them like that, yeah. you're like, oh, this is really legit here. Absolutely, and that, that one is the one that was totally out of sync with the rest mm. of the franchise because you didn't have the traditional family at the right, center right. of it, the Paul Walker, the Vin Diesel, eventually the Rock, etc. cetera. Um, it was a new story, a new central character, they went to Tokyo for <laughs> right, some reason. Right, totally different <laughs> yeah, from the rest uh, of the franchise. And it's just, it's bizarre and interesting, but actually um, the director of that film would go on to direct some of the better reviewed movies of that franchise that kind of defined it. Um, I also love Home Alone 2, Lost mm -hmm. in New York. Yeah, you um, have a whole thing on sequels in here, which I think yeah, is pretty cool. Yeah, sequels worth a second look. Yeah. And I think one of the things about that film was it's kind of about you know, I think one of the things that makes films last is that people see them at a certain time in their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you'll see a few 90s movies sure. and 2000s movies, guess the age of most of our stuff. Right. <laughs> um, but, and they connect with you as your childhood, you're a teenager or something, or you're just discovering film for the first time in a serious way. And for me, Home Alone 2, I saw it when I was a kid. Right. Um, my uncle took me, he eventually passed away, but I was like, man, New York, like I want to live yeah. in New York. I want to run amok. <laughs> and I want to go to the plaza Just and cause some trouble. Plaza, right? go to Central like Park. Ice cream and meet some pigeon women and all that kind of stuff. But like that stuck with me. And I watched it today and I'm like, yeah, I can see what the critics were saying. This is a rehash. Yeah. It's basically a facsimile of the first movie, move the location. One franchise goes to Tokyo, the next one goes to Manhattan. But like that was a good extension of that oh, franchise, yeah. you know? That's what I was saying. I, I, you know, there's no credit on it, but I wrote, the, I wrote that one. You wrote that one And too. it was I'll kind know, of I'll like know. about, um, you know, they took the basic premise of Home Alone, which was every kid's dream, which is to be home alone mm -hmm. and just doing whatever they want and not, not waking up at a certain time right. and that kind of thing. And they just expanded it because what's more fun than running around in this city? Oh <laughs> like, my gosh, yeah, and, especially uh, at that age. Yeah, I mean, um, we're shooting in New York, right. I should say yeah, that. Yeah. But like to run around this, this city when there's that massive toy store, when there's weird characters, when you're in a hotel, it's just, it's it's sort of the dream elevated. They, they added to it in a really smart way, I thought. We got a Donald Trump appearance in there. We too. did, yeah, there's a Donald Trump appearance. That's pretty crazy to think all these <laughs> years later. <laughs> well, he's done, I think he's done a few cameos in his True. time, yeah. yeah. 
So yeah. you did that one, you did Rocky Four, which I love Rocky Four yeah, as well. Yeah, I didn't personally write Rocky Four, mm -hmm. but that was written by a journalist called uh, Amy Nicholson, yeah, yeah. who's just an awesome writer. And she goes in on Rocky <laughs> Four. She loves, it's one of my favorite pieces in the mm -hmm. whole book. So it kind of looks at Rocky Four, which I think some think of as dumb, uh, boxing movies. I loved of. it. I mean, uh, I, mean uh, I know, but it's got it's you know no '80s rock ballad slash power mm -hmm. metal anthem is not in that movie. It's, it's everything. It's yeah. everything. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, but also, it's a really interesting sort of snapshot of I'm getting very like academic here yeah, but <laughs> of uh, of Soviet U.S. sort totally. of perceptions yeah. and relations and. There's you know that great speech that Bridget Nielsen sort of gives about how people are judging her husband, and there's this kind of American excess when it comes to Rocky. <laughs> right. um, and yeah, I think that also laid the seeds for what would become the revamped Rocky With series Creed? in yeah, Creed, which totally. amazing films. I love both of those movies, and they're both very fresh. They would Michael be B. Jordan's book. incredible. Michael B. Jordan's incredible. Even mm -hmm. just all his movies in general. You go back to Fruitvale Station. I mean, yeah, he's he's really good. Uh, we won't talk about Fantastic Four. Mm. No. Fantastic Four. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one yeah, aside. Yeah, let's. But the Michael B. Jordan over. <laughs> it does not. I did. We will. We'll leave Just that leave one. that one. It's not see. in the book either. I got you. <laughs> well, I, I think it's interesting because there's a mention here of like Spielberg and some other people yeah. where it's like. We know these people as all-time greats, but there's also been some mishaps along the way. Yeah. So what was it like kind of diving into that and that was, for you guys? That was really fun. So when we, we, so when we started the process of how to select films for this, we have the ability at Rotten Tomatoes not to give too much away, but I can push a button in our data system and go, give me all the Rotten films right. ever. And so then it comes out on this messy spreadsheet with just like, you, you know those Excel <laughs> spreadsheets where you're like, you're like what uh, am I looking scrolling, at? Scrolling, yep. scrolling, I'm like, is yep. this not scrolling faster? Thousands and thousands and thousands. Then we went in and we said, what are the interesting trends here? So we spoke about cult classics. We spoke about films uh, that were ahead of their time. And then we noticed, wow, there are some films that some major, traditionally fresh directors have done, but uh, they've got some rotten in their mm. record. So we thought it'd be fun to look at a few directors who had a splat yeah. <laughs> on their on their record. And one of them was Spielberg. We've got uh, Wes Anderson there as well mm. with The Life Aquatic with Steve, Steve Zissou. Mm -hmm. um, these, you could call them missteps, but we decided to call the chapter um, I forget the exact name, but it was kind of like, oh, not their best work. Okay. And then in, yeah, a little in, bit, a little bit in parentheses, there. we say, or though they said, mm. because actually when you revisit some of these films, like the one from Spielberg is Hook, right. um, one of his worst reviewed films, rotten on the tomato meter, and yet who of a certain age doesn't love Hook? Sure. <laughs> like yeah, Rufio, you know, like yeah. that whole that whole thing. There was something very uh, that captured childlike adventure in that movie. And so when you revisit it, you're like, actually, this has some of the signatures of Spielberg. He's trying something different. Not everything works, but actually, there's enough of that great Spielberg touch that really makes this something that people treasure. Uh, that's the same with Steve Sisu. Like mm -hmm. everyone was like, too much Wes Anderson quirkiness. Right. But if you're a Wes Anderson fan, you're, you're totally like in drinking it in. Yeah. You're like, you're, you're three Wes Anderson <laughs> beers in. You're like, I'm not stopping. So, yeah. um, and Sophia Coppola is in there. Yep. Ridley Scott. Uh, Ron Howard, yeah, so a lot of names are mm. in there as well. That's really interesting. Mm. So why don't we have a uh, conversation, just outside of this book, like yeah. movies in general this year, mm. Joker's obviously being talked about a lot, yeah. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which I saw, which I really loved. Yeah. So when you think about some of these bigger movies, like movie landscape has totally changed, but how do you guys look at the movie landscape and like particularly those big movies? Like do they still cut through in the same way as you think as some of these other movies from the past? It's, you know, it's a really hard um, landscape, I think, for movies to get big attention in these days because we've got such, there's such a dominance at the box office at the moment with sequels and remakes right. and, 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 and comic book movies. And so it's interesting when you look at Joker, which is a comic book movie, but in vibe, not necessarily. Mm. <laughs> Feels more like a sort of serious drama. Yeah. Managed to cut through once upon a time. So I think for audiences, what they're latching onto is when something do someone does something quite radical and different, I think there are still certain names that people are drawn to that can actually cut through uh, the, the, ma the sort of mass-produced um, studio films that are dominating top of the box office. So you see Tarantino, mm -hmm. DiCaprio together, right. you're hey, like, yep. man, I'm, I'm, in. I'm yeah. in. And audiences did show up for that film, which is interesting because that film is two hours and 40-something. Yeah. You know, it's going to test <laughs> your bladder. Yeah. Don't get the big coat, get the little right. coat. <laughs> um, I, did the, I just got the big wine. But, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there, there's, there's something about that. There's something, you know, look at The Irishman. Mm -hmm. um, that's a movie that I think will cut through because it's got those name, that name recognition, et cetera. Um, what I think is exciting about the landscape now, though, is although it's hard to make noise and get attention at the box office on a weekend, there's such opportunity 
on streaming yeah, and at totally. home. The distribution models have really blown up the system so you can actually find really interesting different works if that's what you're looking for. And obviously that's what we're trying to do at Rotten Tomatoes. Right. So we have the Tomato Meter, we have the audience score which mentions fan sentiment, me measures fan sentiment as well. So you can go in and be like, okay, just say I don't want to go and see mm. um, the latest Marvel pink movie and go and see the latest Marvel movie. <laughs> They're very fun, but you want something different. You can go and see what's out this week, what's been out this year, what's some of the best things of all yeah. time, and you can actually dig in there. And the wonderful thing is that now you don't have to walk up to Blockbuster, and as I had to do as a child, True, oh, yeah. schlep half a mile. <laughs> um, I can just go on whatever streaming network I am, and we've got all that information there. You can see where it's gonna be oh, found, cool. and you can just go and find it. So I think it's really, um, the box office is hard to like top that yeah. because of the dominance of those certain films but there's a democratization of content at the moment, and I think it's really exciting if you're interested in different things. Yeah, even just the conversation around movies. I mean, before Joker even comes out, mm. we're talking about mental health, we're talking about yeah. Joaquin Phoenix, Todd Phillips. Like, yeah. if you have a movie like that that has a lot of chatter, you're gonna check out Rotten Tomatoes to see what it gets, but you're also kind of interested to see like, is this really controversial? Even yeah. like Bruce Lee with Once Upon a Time, like, yeah. you know, there is, at least if a movie has a little bit more conversation, maybe, you know, there's a little bit more incentive to go check it out. Yeah, well, I think it's great as, you know, I talked about the democratization and streaming, et cetera, but the other thing that the internet and that new media has done is really brought a lot of new voices to yeah, the conversation totally. because you don't need to be the person who's employed at a major masthead to, to be the authoritative person on film. You can be someone who's really got talent and who's really got insight and is running your own YouTube channel yeah. and has developed an audience. And you may have a perspective on a film, you may see something that the traditional critics may not have seen uh, in a film like Once Upon a Time and start a conversation. And I think what's really exciting, no matter where you stand on any of these conversations, is that they're happening and that in 2019, when there's people lamenting the fact that there are blockbusters right. that are dominating the top of the box office and they're just all formulaic, some people would say that, uh, not me, but that there are still films out there that people want to dive deep on and, and give opinions of and, and read about, which is great because uh, I think it, it adds a lot to the conversation. Absolutely. Have mm -hmm. you seen Joker yet? I have seen Joker, what yeah. What did you think? Uh, I really, I think Joker's a really interesting film. I think um, what's really great about what it's doing, I think, is that like certain landmark comic book films before, it's doing something different. Mm. So it's decided to meld the traditional story of this character, or one of the traditional right. stories. Comic book purists will tell me there's about 45 <laughs> origin <laughs> stories, course, and that he has no course. origin in this one. But you know, and to meld that with a certain genre with some really interesting influences. Um, if we look back in the past, some of the things that have moved that genre forward are things like The Dark Knight or even Batman Begins, which sort of took a different tonality that we hadn't really seen with that material. Um, in the Marvel Universe, you look at what Taika Waititi did with Thor Ragnarok, mm -hmm. and you're like, wow. It's those people who are having daring um, visions and applying that to what is the sort of biggest mass market genre there is that I think it's really great that they're generating conversations. Um, and I think next year, we're just gonna see more of it. We've got Birds of Prey, mm -hmm. um, the Fabulous Emancipation of Harley Quinn. Yeah, I forget yeah, the subtitle, it's right. very long. But you know, that, they're obviously doing something really interesting there. Um, we've got Wonder Woman 1984, and oh, there's another one. Oh, um, uh, Chloe Zhao, who's mm. doing The Eternals. So I think you're gonna see new voices coming to the genre and uh, giving it a perspective that we haven't seen before. And I think that's exciting. No matter which side of the fence you fall on a movie like Joker, the fact that it's different and that it's starting conversation is exciting to me. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can look at that film, you can look at Black Panther, and just the Black fact that we have new voices, yep. new stories being told, and we need that. It's just not the same Spider-Man again, you know? Like yeah. We need something a little bit different. And look at the movies that are setting the world on fire, yeah. in a good way. I mean, right. I don't mean setting right. the world literally on fire. <laughs> but, you know, Joker's doing it at the moment, so yep. racking up all these numbers. People. Are a lot of people are loving it. The audience score in Rotten Tomatoes is very high. Black Panther was the example that I failed to mention in my previous little uh, bit, but that's that movie just was a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Like we we really hadn't seen anything no, like it, absolutely not. and it was because wow, we haven't seen anything like what's on screen right now. So Coogler, speaking of Creed, yeah. um, and Fruitvale Station actually mm -hmm. comes yeah. in and completely you know upends. He stays within the confines of the genre, but yet he brings this absolute freshness to it. Um, and is richly rewarded for that thing. But I think audiences are getting very excited about what's happening there. Definitely, it's cool mm. to see these filmmakers getting the opportunity. Coogler, Jordan Peele, Ava DuVernay, like oh, yeah. these are just some, and it, like Ava DuVernay didn't pick up a camera until she was in her 30s. You no, know? I like, know, there's a chance for all of us. Insane. Yeah, uh, <laughs> hey, you never know, right? But yeah, no, and Chloe, like what, what Marvel and certain, and DC is doing to yeah. an extent now, is plucking these 
interesting people like um, like Kugler, mm -hmm. like Chloe Zhao, who made a film last year called The Rider, um, like Taika, um, and uh, I believe Ava is doing New Gods. She's oh, gonna really? be, yeah, for okay. DC. So they're, they're taking these people with really interesting perspectives and say, hey, here are our toys, go play. <laughs> and I think that's really exciting yeah. for, 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 for film goers. Here, go do yeah. your thing. Here's, Here's a great a budget. cast. <laughs> and also, we're seeing a lot of like, we're gonna just stack this cast, right? So like, oh. Motherless Brooklyn's coming out, and it's like yep. Bruce Willis, Willem Dafoe. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get Alec Baldwin in there, and like, that's another way that they're trying to get people to the box office again. I know? think so as well. And I think you know, uh, although The Irishman is primarily gonna be released on Netflix, it will have a theatrical right. run, and that is a stacked cast. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Speaking of stacked casts and this movies this year. Um, one film I am unabashedly in love with is a What's film it? called Knives Out. Okay. Uh, it's oh, yes, mm. I feel like I just saw a promo for yeah. this. Tell me again who's in it's this a, So it's a murder mystery film, right. kind of in the vein of Clue. Mm -hmm. um, it's Ryan Johnson, okay. the director who made The Last Jedi, but he also made Looper and other films. Oh, okay. um, and it's got uh, Daniel Craig as the detective, right. Jamie Shannon Lee Curtis, Curtis, Michael Shannon, right. okay. Tony Collette, uh, Don Johnson, uh, Lakeith Stanfield, mm. If I'm missing anyone, I'm sorry, that's a but good, it is a, that's a good line right there. Uh, Christopher Plummer. Mm. It's a stacked cast, and it's so sharply written, it's so fun. Uh, already certified fresh at 99% on the tomato meter, so. Wow. Um, not a rotten movie I love, the fresh movie I love. We'll take a fresh movie. We got <laughs> Clue, enough rotten movies here. I think the original Clue, don't quote me on this, is either on the cusp, or is just fresh, or is just mm. rotten, and people love that movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. no question. Mm -hmm. Joel, it's been a pleasure. No, this has been fun. Thanks so much. Thank Check you. out this guy's book, it's gonna be a good time. For Joel, I'm DJ. See you next time, here on The Sit Down.